Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming back from lunch. <laughs> Hopefully, uh, we didn't have too much to eat. Anyway, uh, my name's uh, Dr. Benjamin Montoya. We've, I've met some of you directly. Maybe some of you I'll meet afterwards during the discussion, but thank you for being here. And thank you especially to Don for inviting me to be a part of it. So, um, as Judge Wise uh, mentioned during his presentation, questions are a key part to historical understanding. I passionately believe this. And I think as historians, we're much more comfortable asking questions and it comes to providing answers, but we also can understand it's difficult to come to those answers. Right, so with this presentation, I'm gonna be doing three things. I'm first gonna give, be giving uh, my short take on Texas Ranger history, some of which has been touched on uh, by some of our other presenters. And then I'm gonna be giving a small take on how historians have treated the Texas Rangers uh, through the 20th century. And then I'll be offering a bit on what this title of the presentation is getting to, this uh, notion of historical empathy. And so really kind of wrestling with uh, how do you, and it's kind of come up with these presentations already, how do you teach this stuff? How do we reconcile the history of the Rangers with the history of Texas in general, and maybe just the history of Mexico and the United States? So I'm coming at this from a deep knowledge of U.S.-Mexican relations and a big, deep study of Mexican immigration. So I've actually learned a lot about Texas Ranger history in the past week, so I'm kind of coming at it from the 30,000-foot view of knowing a lot about what of Mexican history in general, a lot about U.S. history, and a lot about the Mexican Revolution. I just had a mustache competition in my class a couple of days ago. We're talking about the Mexican Revolution. It just kind of seems like the appropriate thing to do. Porfirio Diaz, Emiliano Zapata, Pancho Villa. My provost is in a room. He's like, are we really doing mustache competitions in the classroom? It's just the end of the term, right? Anyway, the Texas Rangers, even before I started to pre prepare for this presentation, have the sense that the Rangers are one of those groups in US history, not just Texas history. I should probably give a, give a disclaimer. I'm not a Texan. I'm originally from Las Vegas, Nevada, so maybe that can be the excuse if you disagree with any of the things I say. I joke with Don Fraser about um, the Texas Revolution, but probably because I study immigration, I joke with him and say, the Texas Revolution was an immigrant-led secessionist movement against the country of Mexico. And I'm not really, he's never really fully told me what he feels about that, but maybe he's too professional to kind of tell me how he really feels. Um, anyway, of course, I'm just being jocular here. But uh, for some of you, you might recognize the name of this historian, Patty Limerick, uh, longtime CU Boulder professor, but most especially a big name in borderlands history. As most good historians know, it's, you can't just take one side over the other. And as she reminds us, and kind of her just totem, and just a classic of a book, talking about the, the West, westward expansion from various guises, she talks about how our, one never has the luxury of taking a point of view, right? We always have to consider the other side, or probably in this case, many different sides. And so the, the goal here is to really try to tease out these different perspectives. I don't have to tell you, you guys already know, the Rangers is a group that have been lauded throughout history, they've been valorized, eulogized, let me give you just a couple of senses of this. And some of these names I'll talk about here more in depth. Uh, Walter Prescott Webb, a historian during the first half of the 20th century, a uh, very famous book published in 1935, the same year that the Rangers become a part of um, kind of, a, I guess, a formal law enforcement agency, the same year that Juan Flores' mother committed suicide. Walter Prescott Webb publishes a book, maybe kind of the first real academic scholarly consideration of the Rangers, which I'll talk about in a second, but this is how he talks about the Rangers in the opening introduction to that book. Standing alone between a society and its enemies, the typical Ranger was a very quiet, deliberate, gentle person who could gaze calmly into the eye of a murderer, divine his thoughts, and anticipate his action. A man who could ride straight up to death. Fast forward about 40 years later, Richard Nixon, you've probably heard of him. Richard Nixon at the opening of the Texas Ranger Hall of Fame offers this uh, quote dedicating the opening of that facility. For one and a half centuries, the Texas Rangers have vividly portrayed the dauntless spirit of the great American Southwest and relentlessly served the best interests of both their state and their nation. I welcome this opportunity to express on behalf of all Americans the deepest admiration for the proud tradition of public service that has earned you 
such a splendid reputation ever since our frontier days. There's probably millions of quotes I could point to that really, again, kind of laud and celebrate the history of the Texas Rangers. I'm gonna show a clip here, it's only about two and a half minutes. This is from the History Channel, it's probably a few years old. Just to give us a sense of, what some of the presenters have already touched on this, the, the positive myth, perhaps, of the Rangers in American history. So let me just quickly get this going here. For nearly 200 years, the Texas Rangers have been fighting to uphold law, order, and justice in Texas. Along the way, they've become internationally famous as the fearless, never-say-die protectors of the vast and rugged land they call home. But who are the Texas Rangers, really? Their story begins back in 1823 with Stephen Austin, the so-called father of Texas. When Texas settlers came under attack from Native Americans, Austin called for volunteers to act as rangers for the common defense. Like the American Revolution's Minutemen, they would assemble as needed and then return home when the danger passed. These volunteers are considered the earliest Texas rangers, though the term was not used officially at the time. By 1835, the struggle for Texas independence was heating up, and colonial representatives formally created a Corps of Rangers to aid in the fight. When Colonel William B. Travis wrote his famous letter pleading for help defending the Alamo, a company of rangers from nearby Gonzales were the only ones to answer his call. They fought and died alongside the other defenders when Mexican troops overwhelmed the Alamo on March 6, 1836. Over the next four decades, Texas went from independence to union to confederacy and back to union. But the Rangers remained. In 1874, the Rangers got a new mission, protecting the frontier from lawless Texans. During the heyday of the Wild West, the Rangers apprehended or killed more than 3,000 criminals, including notorious outlaw John Wesley Hardin and train robber Sam Bass. The discovery of oil at the turn of the century sent fortune seekers rushing into Texas, and the Rangers helped preserve law and order amid the chaos. They also policed the Mexican border during Prohibition, and it was former Texas Ranger Frank Hamer who tracked down the outlaw duo Bonnie and Clyde, putting an end to their multi-state crime spree. As Texas modernized, so did the Rangers. In 1935, they became part of the new Department of Public Safety and set up their first forensic crime lab that same year. Since then, the Rangers have operated as a highly trained elite unit, handling the state's most serious criminal investigations. They've been compared to the FBI, Scotland Yard, and Interpol. There are just 150 Rangers stationed across Texas, so when a spot opens up, it's not unusual for some 100 officers to apply. Rangers don't wear uniforms, but they can still be recognized by their western boots, white hats, and star-shaped badges. And while you might occasionally see one on a horse, today it's more likely to be a car, airplane, or helicopter. Wherever they operate, the Texas Rangers remain one more reason to think twice before messing with Texas. So obviously this <clears throat> brief, sorry, this brief video gives us a, a different impression, definitely a different impression from the documentary you watched this morning. First of all, from a historian's point of view, and I'll talk about this right now, it collapses a great deal of history. There's that one scene where it goes basically from the 1840s to the 1890s. What I'll be doing in the next few minutes is really giving us a sense of how the Texas Rangers developed during those pretty crucial years in American history. So the argument that I'll make is right from the very beginning, Stephen Austin calls for Rangers, he kind of organizes this group, they weren't known as the Texas Rangers then, but calls for this group to push out Indians from land that empresarios were hoping to acquire. All right, so this is even before the Texas Revolution is on their radar, but nevertheless you see already this kind of tension between locals that were there and Rangers who were trying to acquire land. Some historians from during this period start to argue, or some historians looking at this period wonder, are the Rangers really a law enforcement agency? Are they a frontier guard? Or are they more kind of shock troops of, imperial, of imperialism, really? There's one kind of case coming out of this. It'll later go down and known as a Texas legend, but it really kind of dates back to these early years of contact, for lack of a better term, between Mexicans and Texans on the border. And this is the idea of the Texan legend. And I'll give a few quotes here to give you a sense of what this means. But this idea that on the one hand, you have Texans kind of derived from this 
tradition of Anglo expansion across North America in general, kind of tying it back to the founding fathers, which of course ties back to enlightenment principles. By contrast, Mexicans coming out of this Spanish colonization legacy, right? This count, there's uh, anti, not even uh, counter enlightenment ideology that seemed retrograde, seemed barbaric, right? The Inquisition was talked about a lot as this kind of an example of how the Mexicans inherently are backward people. And it didn't help that um, the mixing of blood was inherent to the Mexican identity. For many Anglos, this was considered a, in racial terms, a negative thing, to be sure. Again, that, that legacy of racism was there, but also this kind of nature of violence. And I'm gonna read you another quote here, and we've already seen this image in an earlier uh, part of today, in the Poor Veneer documentary. In the immediate wake of the loss of the Alamo, you'll see Anglo-Texan troops catching up with Santa Ana's troops at a place called San Jacinto. It depends on you know, different pronunciation, different uh, ideologies. If you're from t Texas, San Jacinto. If you're not, or if you're Mexican-speaking or Spanish-speaking, San Jacinto. But anyway, at San Jacinto, obviously, it's not really a battle per se. It's really a massacre, right? Sam Houston's troops surprise Santa Ana's forces. Thousands of Mexicans are killed. Maybe just a handful of Texans are killed. And this is a scene that really, I think, speaks to this immediate animosity right at the very beginning of Texas. The dead Mexicans lay in piles, the survivors not even asking permission to bury them, thinking perhaps that in return for the butchery they had practiced at the Alamo, they would soon be lying dead, dead themselves. The buzzards and the coyotes were gathering to feast, but it is a singular fact that they singled out the dead horses refusing to touch the Mexicans, presumably because of the peppery constitution of the flesh. They lay there unmolested and dried up. The cattle got to chewing the bones, which so affected the milk that residents in the vicinity had to dig trenches and bury them. Right, so again, this, this kind of animosity, this distinction between races along the border. Obviously, we know what happens, right? Texas becomes a Lone Star Republic, goes, is that way for about eight years. It's brought into the Union in 1845. Texas becomes a part of this uh, secessionist fever, as it's known during these years in some states. But even before then, as was mentioned earlier, slavery was at the center of Texas's founding, and so Texas was a part of the slave South. The Underground Railroad actually existed in Texas. But instead of going to the Ohio River, went south across the border. The Rangers would play a part in actually reacquiring slaves, right? So in a, maybe not a strange way, but in a very direct way, the Texas Rangers played a part in maintaining slavery in a place like Texas. And they gained various nicknames, whether it's before the Mexican-American War, but especially during it, whether it's Los Rinches de la Quenena, which basically means the Rangers of King, right? So the Rangers of the King Ranch, the cattle baron, of the 1840s, 1850s, 1860s. But also, especially during the Mexican-American War, getting this other nickname that was more prevalent, Los Diablos Tejanos. Obviously, the, the Texas, Texan devils, however you want to trans translate it. The Mexican-American War starts in 1846. The Texas Rangers play a key role, especially in guiding American troops as they invaded Mexico. But even for American military commanders, Zachary Taylor, Winfield Scott, as much as they appreciated ranger assistance, they were also appalled at the degree of violence that rangers would practice against Mexican citizens to the point where they actually had to recall some ranger activities in central Mexico, right? And it's during these years that you see all kinds of lore, some of it probably based in fact, some of it more apocryphal. One of them is this idea of the old rusty gun of how as rangers are prowling through the border regions, as the line between bandit and civilian is very porous, very thin. In other words, was this Mexican killed for reasons of crime or was this Mexican killed for being Mexican? One of the stories was old rusty guns were carried around by the Rangers left at the scene of a crime to kind of give this impression that they were fired upon first. Whether this is true or more apocryphal, as I just mentioned, what it speaks to is almost from nearly the beginning, this distrust between rangers and Mexicans. This image right here called Young Texas in Repose from the 1850s. This is actually uh, printed by uh, 
Eastern newspaper. I forget, maybe New York City. And it gives you a sense of how, for many other Americans outside of Texas, Texas itself, but maybe more specifically the Rangers, have this pretty controversial standing. In this case, it has nothing to do, well, it has something to do, but in this case, the, the target audience is African Americans. Right, this idea, let me see if I can zoom in to give you a sense of the detail of this image. So this is depicting a Texas Ranger, obviously a very unattractive characterization, and you might not be able to see it in the back, but you'll see these words on his arm, such as slavery, fraud, rape, slavery again. The argument being that the Rangers are playing a key part in maintaining slavery. Okay. The Civil War comes and goes. Right, Texas is the seventh state of 11 to secede. The war is lost, but as we know, during the re period of Reconstruction, going into the Gilded Age, uh, you see different forms of racial marginalization, most especially for African Americans throughout the South. But for parts of Texas where the bi dominant minority group is not African American, even though formal segregation doesn't necessarily exist in every part of Texas towards Mexican Americans, you would still see very strong trappings of it and similarities with other parts of the South. And so during these years, you would see the Texas Rangers, right, secession is over. And it's no longer really this matter of invading a foreign country, but now it's a matter of acquiring land, displacing Mexican-American families. In some cases, their targets expand to African-American populations. Over 400 lynchings happen in Texas between the 1880s and the 1930s. That's basically 10 for every year. The Rangers aren't involved in every single one of those things. But nevertheless, it gives you an idea of how in post-Civil War Texas, this idea of maintaining a Jim Crow system, the Rangers were on the front line of doing this. So as we get to the period of poor veneer, we see a, a not so pretty picture coming into focus. As the poor veneer uh, documentary mentions, 1910 is an operative year in Texas-Mexican relations with the start of the Mexican Revolution. Right? And in case you don't know much about the Mexican Revolution, all mustaches aside, it's a very violent period one of the most violent periods in Mexican history, and that's saying a lot for a, a country that goes through various civil wars, has various foreign interventions throughout its 200-year-long 200 200 year history. The Mexican Revolution between 1910 and 1920 will see millions of Mexicans either displaced or killed. And it's in this context, and I think this is where my real interest in U.S.-Mexican relations really plugs in well here, it's in this context that we have a pretty strong sense of how poor veneer might have fit. So let me bring up a map here. Uh, I'll come to, back to that, let me start here. So first of all, what this map is showing, and this comes out of the major problems in Texas history book, in case you're interested, I can give you the citation. What this map is showing, as you can see right here, location of killings of Americans in Northern Mexico and by Mexicans along the American border, 1910 to 1919. And you can see all these different spots, if whether it's southern New Mexico, but especially kind of western Texas, northern Chihuahua, central Chihuahua, Coahuila, so on, so on and so forth throughout northern Mexico. Obviously, this is just a map showing American dead. What this map isn't showing, and probably would be impossible to tabulate, is what would be the reverse? What kind of uh, atrocities would you see Americans against Mexicans across the border? And if you know anything, about the Mexican Revolution, maybe throughout this whole period, the border was very porous. To talk about closed or open borders, you know, for many of these years, the border was more of a suggestion. It wasn't a coincidence that many Mexican revolutionaries, dating back all the way to someone like Benito Juarez, Porfirio Diaz, they set up shop in places like San Antonio, right? It was this connection between Southern Texas and Mexican revolutionary activities was quite easily done. But you'll notice in this map, I have a little, I drew a little circle right here. That's where poor veneer is. And so what this map is hopefully illustrating for us is poor veneer, even before January 1918, poor veneer, far from being this isolated town, small isolated town in distant West Texas, is actually at the center of much of this cross-border violence. The documentary touched on this briefly, but what's also one of the reasons why the border is such a dangerous spot 
is because of arms trade, right? I mean, if we, if you know uh, Pancho Villa, his famous raid against Columbus, New Mexico, which is featured in this map right here, a lot of that animosity dates, is attributed to a lack of arms being dealt to Villa after he paid for them, right? So first of all, this, chat, this map is giving you that sense of, you know, poor Venera was not so isolated as it might have seemed. What this map is showing, and actually let me zoom out a little bit more than I can zoom in. You can see it's a map of the northern Mexican state of Chihuahua. And what it's showing predominantly is General Pershing's punitive expedition of 1916 and 1917, right? This is in reaction to Villa's invasion or cross-border attack into Columbus. And what the dominant black line shows is where that invasion route took place. But e even this map shows as well, Port Veneer is still especially when you talk about another small intervention by U.S. forces into the same state of Chihuahua in 1919, Port Veneer is not, not isolated. Okay. What does this tell us? It tells us of a deep, first of all, history of problems, deep history of violence, deep history of maybe of lack of protection. This image was actually referenced by uh, Doctor uh, by Professor Johnston, I have it just by pure happenstance. I brought for, have it for my presentation right here. I'll come back to the 19 teens here in a second. But even when we get beyond the, the years of the Mexican Revolution, World War One, World War Two, now we're talking about the, the moment of integration in U.S. history: the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s. Unfortunately, the Texas Rangers, at least some of them, were on the wrong side of history here. This is that image that Dr. Johnson was talking about. In 1956, rangers sent to Mansfield, uh, Texas, northern Texas, in the Dallas area. This is that effigy that he was talking about as Texas rangers, as many southern state authorities during the 1950s, spurned this idea of integration of public schools. Okay. What I don't have an image of is during the 1960s as well, you'll see the rangers playing a part uh, in combating UFW, United Farm Workers, activities throughout the South, whether it's pressuring for better wages, pressuring for unionization rights, so on and so forth. So we, we have a bit of a complicated history. Because the fact is, too, you know, it's all about point of view. When we go back to the immediate years of independence for Texas, when we go to the immediate um, kind of early frontier days of Texas, the fact was, let me see if I can find a good map for it. Let's go back to one of these. The fact is, these were very dangerous areas. And if you were living in Texas in the 1840s, 1850s, if you were an Anglo, Anglo settler, the Rangers were kind of one of the few forces dividing you and utter destruction. In the years before the Civil War, there were some journalists on the ground, there were some reports coming out of Texas that far from Texas expanding, because of Indian incursions, especially by the Comanche, it was actually becoming more and more dangerous to live in these areas. And actually attrition rates among the rangers in the 1850s was astronomical, about an 80% death rate among rangers. So on the one hand, rangers as this force of expansion, imperialism, on the other hand, kind of the lone guarding unit for Anglo settlers, predominantly in central Texas. And of course, this is all interpretation. Feel free to disagree with me. Blame my Nevada past. I'll leave it up to you. But how did historians view this? The first real um, academic treatment, I would say, of the Texas Rangers comes about 10 years after the massacre at Port Veneer. This man pictured right here, Eugene Barker, published as you see right here in Mexico and Texas, 1821-1835, publishes it in 1928. And I'll just give you some snapshots of these next few books to give you an idea of their interpretation in general. And from his point of view, kind of strangely in line with these broad deterministic, um, almost eugenics-based views of how races aligned or fought against each other during these years. He kind of viewed Texas history as this great struggle between two distinct races, one that was civilized, one that was uncivilized. Let me share this quote with you right here. At the bottom, 
In other words, in, in some, at the bottom, the Texas Revolution was a product of the racial and political inheritance of the two peoples. What he goes on to argue is Texas was founded by this proud group of Anglos that was derived directly from the founding fathers, the same men who founded the United States 60 years before they founded Texas. By contrast, the Mexicans were derived from a system of superstition, backwardness, non-enlightened principles. And so for Barker, again, he has this deterministic kind of viewpoint that really was at the time not that uncharacteristic with how other scholars discussed situations of foreigners. Maybe you've come across this book. Madison Grant was an American anthropologist, and in 1916, during World War I, he published a very notable book. Sold quite well. Many be people believe this argument that he basically lays down about how to handle the immigration question. He calls it the passing of the great race. And what he's basically arguing is, in this time of massive immigration to the United States, if he uses the word Nordic, right, he kind of divides the world races into distinct groups. Nordics, Alpines, Mediterraneans, Negroids, to use his words, Mongoloids, Asiatics, and he had them in a hierarchical system. So Nordics were predominantly white Northern, white Western Europeans. The reason that they were so successful is because of their inher inherent racial superiority. By contrast, again, this is still Grant's argument, by contrast, Negroids, in other words, Africans, Mongoloids of Asia, the reason they were not as successful as a country like Britain, for example, is because of their inherent racial inferiority. So in a strange way, at least I would argue, Barker is making this case that you see something similar going on in relations between Mexicans and Americans, this idea that you have this classic, classic clash of cultures, to use perhaps a Huntington phrase. A much more notable treatment of the, of the Rangers follows less than a decade later. Walter Prescott Webb was a longtime UT Austin history professor in 1935 same year that Juan Flores' mother commits suicide, the same year that the Texas Rangers become a part of the U.S. Department of Public Safety. He publishes his book, the Texas, Ranger, the Texas Rangers, A Century of Frontier Defense. And this version, at least, you'll notice, has a forward by a prominent Texan, right? LBJ himself. Anyway, he builds off of Barker's deterministic language, almost to kind of give you this idea that conflict was inevitable between the Mexicans and the Texans. And not just inevitable, but it was inevitable that the Texans would win. Let me just give you the longer version of this quote right here. Without disparagement, it may be said that there is a cruel streak in the Mexican nature, or so the history of Texas would lead one to believe. This cruelty may be a heritage from the Spanish of the Inquisition. It may, and doubtless should, be attributed partly to the Indian blood. Among the common class, ignorance and superstition prevail. The Mexican warrior was, on the whole, inferior to the Comanche and wholly unequal to the Texan. By the 1930s, this was kind of the standard view. Webb really just kind of capitalizes on the standard view taking shape of the Rangers as this heroic force of defense on the front line of barbarity on the other side of the border and civility on the American side of the border. But you start to see your response. His name was actually brought up earlier this morning. Americo Paredes publishes in 1958, ironically, he goes to UT, I'll give a little anecdote here. He goes to UT Austin, he's actually in the English department, he's not a historian. And he, in the 1950s, he's going through his doctoral program as, you, as usually happens, right? You submit your dissertation for a consultation by a committee. Of all people, who is on that committee is Walter Prescott Webb, who by this point is a legend, right? He is the person when it comes to Texas Rangers history. Paredes is encouraged by his dissertation committee to kind of soften his criticism of the Rangers. The long and short of it, he, he doesn't, but as he famously says a few years after he leaves graduate school, if looks could kill from Webb, you know, kind of looking at him within the halls of UT Austin. If looks could kill, I would have been dead a long time ago. Anyway, in 1958, he publishes this book uh, with his pistol in his hand. And it's basically uh, it's, it's just as much of a novel as opposed to a historical account. 
And what it offers is this counter view of the Rangers, as I have a small quote right here, a romantic interpretation of the Rangers. He's challenging this notion by saying, you know, instead of these guys being heroic defenders, they are on the front lines of oppression. And he really teases out this word rinche, which basically just means ranch, uh, ranger. But what he enlightens audiences to think about is kind of like equivalent to the word clansman. Right? In a purely general sense, a Klansman is just someone who's part of a clan. But in a, for anyone who knows American history, the second you say Klansman, you know what we're talking about. And what Paredes is mentioning is anytime a Mexican-American hears the word Rinche, Ranger, what they're thinking of is this long history of violence, wanton violence against them. Okay? This theme carries over as we get to through the civil rights era, 1950s, 1960s, a whole new range of scholars questions all kinds of things in American history, whether it's US diplomatic history, when it comes to racial history. So it's part of that larger historiographical trend that you, it's probably natural, that the rangers are being called into question as well. A book published in 1979 called Gunpowder Justice is pretty direct. So whereas Webb in 1935 was quite celebratory of the Rangers. Here we are about 40 years later, and writers of gunpowder justice are quite polemical. They even go so far as to say the Rangers should be closed down. They are a terrorist group. They even go so far as to compare them to the Ku Klux Klan. Right? The Ku Klux Klan exists in states like Alabama, Georgia. In Texas, the equivalent are the Rangers, authors from gunpowder justice would argue. As you can see right here, Mexican Americans endured systematic persecution at the hands of the Rangers. So where do we go? You might recognize some of these figures. It's okay if we don't. I came across this idea of historical empathy about a year ago, and I'm always trying to think about how do I connect my students to various themes of history, right? I, I teach early American history, modern American history, how do you get students to try to care, basically, about history? I'm not sure about some of the other professors in the room, but I know the big challenge I always struggle with is not so much what political side do we take, right? It's, we don't have these big discussions between right and left. The bigger challenge I face is indifference from students. Why should I care about this, right? Cell phones don't help with all this kind of stuff. Social media doesn't help either. And so I came, this, this notion of historical empathy has really intrigued me of how can we have students understand that what took place in the past is something that we can relate to. And by relating to it, we don't have to necessarily like it, and we certainly don't have to um, imbibe it. We don't have to agree with it. But by empathizing with it, we can maybe understand, as was stated earlier, we can maybe understand why these things happen and come to a true reckoning of them. So let me introduce where this idea came from. Before he became the father of capitalist theory, basically, the person illustrated on the far left there, Adam Smith, his first book, maybe you've come across this, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, written by Adam Smith, he makes this case that empathy is the ability to connect with people. And he kind of compared it to sympathy. Later scholars would disagree with this. But nevertheless, Adam Smith, from the very beginning, this is like the 1750s, makes this case that it is possible to connect with someone from the past based on this innate human sympathy that we have for each other. A few years after that, Johann Erber, focused in the center left here, a German philosopher, German historian, formalizes this and says we can actually not just sympathize, but even if you don't understand or even if you don't like what happened in the past, you can tease out what drove those people to do whatever that situation is, whatever that history was. This person pictured in the right center is a German philosopher, late 1800s, 1880 specifically, Wilhelm Dilthe, who takes it a little bit farther, maybe a little too far, I'll let you decide for yourself. He says, not only is it possible for us to understand the past, but we can relive it, to use this phrase. We can be in the moment to understand what it was like to have gone through certain things. There's finally this person on the far right, Max Weber, the famous German sociologist, the guy who wrote the Protestant work ethic and so on. He will famously say, you don't have to be Caesar to have understood Caesar. So all this to say that 
Empathy is a, this interesting concept that, first of all, theorists try not to confuse with sympathy. So when I say historical empathy, what I'm not saying is we have to apologize or try to agree with. But as I go through today, I want you to kind of wonder for yourself, is, is it truly, is that distinction truly that solid or is it still pretty loose? But theorists take it a little bit farther. They say there's actually multiple kinds of empathy. Many education scholars agree. I mean, it's so well agreed upon, most history teachers don't even really think about it. And every time we teach, every time we offer a primary document, we just assume someone's going to be able to connect, right? I wouldn't, when I teach the Boston Tea Party in class and I give a document to my students of a patriot arguing for independence, this is me trying to just take for granted that students can cognitively, intellectually, understand what was going on at the time. So many education scholars will agree that cognitive empathy is possible, but then it starts to get a bit fuzzy when you get to the next definition, kind of getting back to Wilhelm Dilthey. Can we understand what it felt like? This is effective empathy. Can we understand what it felt like to go through this particular incident, whether it's a revolution, whether it's a massacre, whether it's a war? Can we understand what it was like to go through this? And so historians debate, and I won't give you the long version of this, I'll just give you the condensed version. Historians debate, can you have both cognitive and affective, or is it just cognitive? And even some historians debate, there's no way you can empathize with the past. Read as many documents as you want. If you haven't been a soldier, there's no way you know what it's like to be a soldier. If you haven't seen a massacre, there's no way you can know what it's like to live through a massacre, so on and so forth. So again, I'll let you decide what is most convincing but education scholars debate this idea of what is the role of empathy? How far can we take it? Is it constructive? Is it non-helpful? Is it inherently possible, right? These scholars argue there's a few conditions for us to truly understand what comes together. And in fact, I'll talk about both of these points simultaneously. First of all, we have to understand what's surrounding a particular incident. I showed you those two maps of Port Vanier. You can't really understand what happened in late January 1918 unless you understand that there was revolution on the Mexican side of the border. There was a deep-seated, maybe systemic animosity between the Rangers and Mexicans on the American side of the border, right? So this is the historical context. But as all historians know, your inquiry is only as good as the sources you have. And this is where the analysis of any massacre is difficult, whether it's the Rwanda massacre of 1994 or the Port Vanier one of 1918. We, we're, we're limited by what we can see from the past because then it starts to get just into conjecture, speculation, so on and so forth. So you can only empathize, but then it, so it begs the question, can we only know what it was like to go through Port Vanier if we have sources on it? If you don't have a document, then where does that history go? because some of those education scholars who say empathy is not possible, the reason they say it's not possible is you can't draw a line between yourself and the history you're studying. Some scholars refer to it as egoistic drift. In other words, your own person, what you think you are connecting to in terms of empathy is actually just an extension of you. Another education scholar puts it this way. Your, your position, your positionality, your characteristics, your whatever that is, your income, your education level, your racial background, your age, your positionality determines how you view a certain episode. And on the other side of things, your impositionality, how you view a particular historical source is influenced by yourself. So can you really empathize with what happened 100 years ago when you aren't a poor goat farmer living in an isolated spot? Or is there something innate to all of us that we actually can, by the nature of being human, we can understand what pain and suffering is. Franz de Waal is a primatologist, which means he studies monkeys. But what's interesting about this book by him from 2009 called The Age of Empathy is that he is really analyzing, first of all, he's debunking this idea that the animal world is inherently cruel. So he's challenging this idea of social Darwinist thought and says, 
you know, as social Darwin has argued 150 years ago, we should replicate the animal world where you just, the, the, the strongest survive. In fact, what he analyzes when he looks at the relationship of primates is they actually care for each other. There's ticks in the behavior of uh, orangutans and monkeys that show that far from the, from the natural world just being out to kill each other, they actually take steps to preserve their community. And he's talking about empathy. He's not talking about historical empathy, but what he's talking about in a very powerful way is how empathy has this innate quality of connection and preservation. But what most notably stands out here for this presentation and where I'll go next is he says that empathy has to have a face, which also gets back to the issue of historical sources. You're limited by what you can connect with. So can you empathize? Again, empathy does not mean you have to sympathize with what he did, but can you empathize with Caesar even though you've never been a Roman general, even though you've never led men into battle, even though you don't know what it's like to fight hand to hand with a small broadsword? But nevertheless, can you understand, can you empathize what drove Caesar? Can you understand why some colonists in the 1770s and some in the 1780s fought for independence and why some resisted independence, actually fought against it. Not just can you understand it intellectually, taxes, we hate the British, they force us to drink tea, all this kind of stuff. But can, we, can you understand on a deep, effective, emotional level why this was dangerous? Revolution's audacious, isn't it? Why take that crucial step of pushing against at the time, the most powerful empire in the world, okay? Can we understand what, um, I'll use the word carefully here, I might, I'll just use the word forces perhaps, what obliges, what forces Mexican migrants to cross the border, to seek a better livelihood, to try to dodge various dangers in the process? Can we understand why this happens? Can we understand the forces behind an incident such as the Holocaust? None of us, I don't think, have lived in, this, in the kind of situation that this particular prisoner lived in. Can we nevertheless somehow connect to the, the suffering that person went through? This next image will be pretty grisly, I warn you. Can we understand the, what it might have been like for victims of massacre? In this case, the bombing of Hiroshima. It's a challenge. For the victims of massacre in 1968 in My Lai, during the Vietnam War, to kind of bring it to the more specific here, can we understand what, what drove the Rangers? Border security, frontier safety, land acquirement, community stability, Rape, rapine, conquest, what is it? Are they frontier heroes? Are they frontier oppressors? Okay. By contrast, do we have any, can historical empathy give us a sense of what it might have been like to be in a small village, in basically the center of a war zone? a war zone informed by revolution, informed by deep-seated racism? Can we understand you know, this operative phrase right here? It's come up earlier, it came up in the uh, documentary. It's very much a loaded phrase, dead Mexican bandits. During the Mexican Revolution, actually between 1915 and 1916 alone, there was a, a recorded 30 cross-border raids from Mexico into the United States, the most famous being obviously Villas in March 1916. All right, so again, that idea of the border being this very fluid uh, division, very much a place of violence. You know, so on, on the one hand, this person, these victims being viewed as perpetrators, on the other hand, victims as innocent bystanders who have just been caught in the middle of things, okay? And again, this gets us back to, I'm gonna show some still shots from the documentary itself. When it comes to a lack of sources, because as that documentary showed us, the, the only real source we have of that incident was a person. 
who for decades was afraid to share this story. And so the documentary fills in gaps in itself. Can we use these, in this case, fictionalized faces, not fic me, uh, dramatized faces, fictionalized is the wrong word, dramatized faces to help us make that connection, that facial connection, that em uh, empathetic connection. I mean, no one knows what the actual scene was like, but does this dramatization of it help us? He can never forget how he saw his father, right? You see this image of a young man, young uh, Juan Flores being depicted here, minutes before his father is taken away for the last time. And so it brings up, again, historians are very good at asking questions. I'm no different. The answer is a lot harder to come by. Getting back to Patty Limerick, she says that the interpretation, you know, interpretations of history is like writing a seesaw. It's this kind of constant process of back and forth. And the statue, uh, based off of a Texas ranger named Jay, Bank that, Jay Banks, that opens up in Love Field, I believe it was the 1960s, but someone can correct me on that. As you can see right here with some flight attendants, you know, looking up at it. To bring it up to the present day, all kinds of questions about what is the legacy, the historical legacy of the Rangers? Is this a group to be celebrated? What's even the phrase Texas Rangers mean? Not sure how much you guys follow uh, professional football, right? But this is a big question when it comes to things like the Washington Redskins. I mean, for the longest time, I mean, they're not the Washington Redskins anymore, are they? They're Washington Commanders. They went a whole season without a proper name because of this question of how do we reconcile American history when it comes to indigenous peoples? We have a similar thing going on here. The last I checked on it, Texas Rangers owners are not considering whatsoever this idea of readdressing the name of the baseball team in reference to this checkered historical legacy of the Rangers. But in one of those ways, the debate is changing. The statue is no longer there in Love Field. And as you can see right here, this airport worker, presumably of Hispanic descent, applauding the taking down of this ranger statue just a few years ago. So again, for my purposes here, it's really just to kind of give us a sense of how empathy can inform our views of the rangers. Unfortunately, it's not simple. For many decades in the border region, the Rangers played a role in maintaining security. There was a lot of threats. I didn't go into great deal detail about it, but if you're living in Texas in the 1830s, 1840s, the Comanches scared you to death. It was, this was a very real threat. And even when that moment passes, however, are the Rangers, again, this force of security or are they a force of oppression? And the reverse, you know, when we get back to images like this, where do you draw the line? Where was I? What about here? How does, how does historical empathy help us understand who's a perpetrator and who's, in, who's innocent? Okay. Do, we have, do I have any questions? Well, great. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to take some more comments on this or take some questions as we roundtable it.